We're going to give people a, a, just a couple, another minute or so to get um, everybody transitioned in from the waiting room before we get started. Hi, well, I think that everybody it looks like on from my view that looks like everybody's transitioned in and I want to welcome you to the webinar today uh, when school calls about behavior. And um, you'll if you open the chat, there'll be opportunities for you to put some comments in there if you have questions as we go. And also um, you'll be able to get copies of um, the materials that I'm gonna either go over today or that I'll be sharing links to. So feel free to put post your questions as we go. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. So. I am Karen Elfner, and I work for the Behavior Alliance of South Carolina. And I'm new to South Carolina. I've spent most of my career, about 30 years, in the state of Florida, um, but always have been working in the field of behavior support, um, first as a teacher, um, students that had very challenging kinds of um, behavioral needs. And then also doing some research in those populations and classrooms and have worked um, uh, worked on parent involvement projects, much as like the one that is bringing this webinar to you today. And then also statewide behavior support projects. Um, and then probably most importantly, I'm a parent and now a grandparent of little ones who really teach you um, how much you don't know about behavior <laughs> when you're trying to support them. So um, we're all we're all in a learning curve always when it comes to um, helping little ones and learn behavior. So I can. It's my side. So this is again my the Behavior Alliance of South Carolina, which is the new project that I'm part of, and we're affiliated with the South Carolina teams funded through the State Department of Education. And um, just so you kind of see what our mission and vision is, we primarily work with school districts to support their way of work to support uh, families and students. Um, but we also do some direct uh, support things that you can access if you're into social media. We are on all these platforms you see here, and our handle is at Basque Behavior. So on any of those um, platforms, that is how you would connect with us. We also have a, a newsletter mailing list um, that you can connect with, and then you can be um, get our monthly newsletter, which has lots of tips and things as well as the kinds of professional learning that we offer. So, but today my goal is to help you think about when a, when the school calls about behavior, um, how to prepare you. And one of the, the way that I'm gonna try to support you in that is in understanding some things that you should be able to see in a classroom. Um, that's using effective practices and then understanding the functional behavior assessment process, the FBA and the behavior intervention planning process, the BIP, and how family members can support what's happening in the schools. So that's my goal for today. Um, so when a school calls about behavior, is it more likely to be because your child is just having a fabulous day and their behavior is outstanding in a model? Or is it more likely to be because they're having a problem? So if you, this is our uh, a practice using the chat. So in your own experience, which has been more likely to be when you hear when the school calls? Problems, yes. Unfortunately, that tends to be the truth. 
And the way that I like to think about it is that educators have a whole bunch of things they're trying to accomplish. They're, they're trying to teach, do lesson planning and all the curriculum and all the other tasks that go along with being an educator. And when anything interrupts that flow, that's when they get attended to. So that's a problem behavior. It's a behavior that interrupts with the educators doing their business of educating, right? So um, unfortunately, that tends to be the case. And so that's when the it gets noticed is when it's a problem, not when it's everything is going along well. So one of the first questions that, and most important questions to ask if you get a call about your child having problems in the classroom is, is the classroom set up for success? Because um, from my experience, many years, when I would be called into a school to address the behavior of a, an individual student, um, I would go into that classroom and it was very hard for me to identify the student as being whether that student had a problem or not because the classroom itself had so many problems it it needed support and without the classroom supports being in place it was hard to tell whether it was a child specific problem or a classroom problem and so i like for as a parent for people to think about that when you get a call about how your child's doing it could indeed be that your child needs some support but it could also be that the classroom itself needs to be better uh, supported. So let's start there because that's where I start when I'm a, as a professional going into support in the classroom. So we want to set set students up for success. And what does that look like? Um, so when we think about behavior supports, the traditional view um, is what is here on the left. So this is what historically we would always see. Uh, it's reactive. Like I was mentioning, we don't attend to the uh, behavior unless it's a problem that's interrupting our flow of, of teaching. And then the focus is on stopping the problem. So the focus is on getting rid of that thing that's interrupting our flow of what we're trying to do. And generally, we want a quick fix, right? We don't want to spend much time thinking about it. Um, and so any one fix that we think will work for everybody, that's the one fix we want. Well, what we know about behavior supports and we've learned in the science of behavior over many years is that it's much better if we can be proactive and we can intervene, we can prevent behaviors from becoming a problem. And we can focus on teaching skills, often new skills or maybe reinforcing the skills that we need and long-term interventions. So we're not just trying to stop a problem from happening immediately, but we're trying to create and build the, the kinds of skills and behaviors that we want to see. And most importantly, that we'll talk about a lot today is that interventions are matched to the purpose of behavior. So they can't be general. They, If a child needs some individualized support, we're going to need to understand the purpose of the meaning of that behavior. So we're gonna move from those old traditional ways and into the current ways of a more positive behavior support process. So it's also helpful, as I said, to understand that classroom management strategies should be and are necessary for all students. These are not practices that are needed for some students. These are kinds of things that we should be seeing in all classrooms because they're necessary for all students. So when you ask for a classroom to implement the kinds of strategies I'm going to be talking about here, you're not asking for any kind of special treatment for your child individually that shouldn't be expected for all children to receive. And these are evidence-based practices. And when we use that term evidence-based, what we mean is there's research um, from peer-reviewed studies that would indicate that when you use these practices, you get better behavior outcomes. So that's what we mean. And in, in this case, there are a lot of studies and they all coalesce around these common kinds of practices in classrooms. So 
We're going to kind of go briefly through these because if you get a call from the school about your child's behavior, you could just stop and think, Are it does that classroom for my child have these basic structures? So do they have, um, are they have good environment and structures in the classroom? So this is a real simple one. If you think about it, what does the classroom look like? What is the layout? Is it organized? Is it, are there clear sight lines or, or are, there lot, are there lots of things everywhere? Um, and that's not a good setting. You can sort of see in the illustration there, a lot of opportunities for um, problems and distraction here. So just even the classroom layout and the structure of how things are organized within the day and the schedule and the physical layout. And then there's the importance of teaching um, what we expect. And so when we think about what we expect, um, we're doing that in a very specific way. So in this example, what you see is a school that has some school-wide expectations, which is pretty common if you're in a school that does um, has school-wide behavior support pro uh, processes. They usually have some school-wide expectations. And these are concept level things that apply to everybody everywhere. Like everybody's gonna be responsible and organized and have a positive attitude. But what's really important is not just to have these words, but to define what that looks like for your child in different settings. So in a classroom, in a small group setting, when we're having small group, you're responsible by participating in the activities. And <clears throat> you're organized when you bring your necessary materials to the group area and you demonstrate a positive attitude when you wait your turn to speak. So you see in these other illustrations, the teacher here has picked certain things that happen in the classroom and been very clear and concrete about what they expect the students to be doing in those different settings. And so this is very helpful because the more clear we are with what we want to see, the more likely that we're gonna be able to see that, right? So we can teach um, these kind of social behaviors and rules and routines, but we can also teach social emotional um, skills and behaviors. So here's an example of um, a classroom where they're teaching some self-regulation skills. And so we're given, they learn some strategies for how to manage when they need to help calm themselves. And they've got this nice illustration that reviews the strategies for them so they can be reminded when they're feeling stressed of those strategies that they've been taught and reviewed. So we, um, we're maximizing our structure, we're uh, teaching what we expect, and then we're using really powerful engagement strategies in the classroom. So um, gone are the days where we would expect a teacher to just stand at the front of the uh, board and all the students to sit with their hands folded on their desk for eight, six hours a day. So what we know is that when you can motivate students by incorporating interest and um, the topics and how you're doing things and active learning. So they get to be part of the learning process. They're not passively sitting and listening, but they get to engage and respond. And this example here gives you lots of ways that teachers can incorporate engagement strategies across their day. And then of course, acknowledging. So using praise or acknowledgement or reinforcement, lots of words that all kind of are talking about the same thing, which is doing something that is rewarding or reinforcing, reinforcing after a behavior, immediately after the behavior. And it's more likely then that that behavior is gonna happen again. And what we know is that the more specific you are with that kind of praise or recognition, um, the more powerful that can be. So if I use the term like, good work, good job, then the student or the, your child may say, I think I know what they think I did that was so good, but I have to kind of guess from what just happened when they said that. But on the other hand, if I say, uh, it's so helpful when you put all your things inside your desk, now I know exactly what I did that the teacher liked. And so it makes it more likely you're going to see those, those specific behaviors. 
in the future. So acknowledgement, praise, reinforcement, and with specificness when you can. And then there are just lots of these, what we call um, management strategies. So when there's these low level behaviors that happen, that often happen in a classroom when kids are not engaged and not interested or bored or whatever happens, uh, but that can be low intensity for the teacher and don't have to take away really from the instructional flow, but can actually be powerful to redirect to change behavior. So proximity, that's just getting like I'm teaching and the students starting to do something distracting over here. I just walk over and keep teaching, but I'm standing near the student and my proximity getting closer to that student makes the student less likely um, to engage in that behavior. Redirection, reteaching, providing choices. So there's a whole bunch of strategies here that teachers can use. So um, we want to see a breadth of these strategies that are being applied when these low level behaviors happen. So let's think in your experience in your children's classrooms, have you seen any of these um, essential classroom practices? So let's just get a picture. Uh, see, do you see any of them? If so, you can pick as many of them as you see. I don't see anybody voting. There, yes. Seeing a lot of them. The, let's see, we've got a lot of, of structure. That's good. Structure is doing well. Um, some student engagement. Acknowledging appropriate behaviors. Um, okay, I'm going to, um, it, do you want, I'm going to share the results now. So you can see just from our little group here, um, we've got a lot of maximizing structure and classroom norms, um, and acknowledging, but the, the student engagement maximized that is not quite as high and the responding behavior specific praise. So, um, you know, maybe these are things that we could share some strategies with our educators to get them to engage more in those practices. So, so um, let's say that you've got a classroom for, yeah, you've gotten a call and the classroom seems to have most of the elements um, to some degree going on, but your child still needs some additional support. Well, what kind of support, what is that gonna look like? Well, we used to, maybe we talked about the new approach to behaviors being one where you really need to understand the purpose of the behavior or the function, that's another word for it. So when we talk about function-based support, it's understanding the purpose of behavior. And from our project's perspective, in terms of helping educators to do function-based support, we recommend that they use the level of intensity of their support should match the level of intensity or severity of the behavior. So if the behavior is a lower level kind of behavior, it's kind of annoying, it's happening often, it's a problem, but it's not severe, then we don't need to put lots of really heavy, intense resources into that um, problem solving process. So we wanna do kind of a match there. And so, this is, we don't know, I don't know every school that you're in exactly what that's going to look like. Um, but if you think about the range of ways that you can do function-based support, and that middle category is um, FBA or function-based intervention, FBAs and BIPs. That's just your basic FBA and BIP. If you're familiar, if you've heard that, we'll talk a lot about that today. Then there are some approaches that are kind of on the lower end of that, that don't take as much resources and time, data collection, that kind of stuff, but uses the same principle of learning the purpose or function of the behavior. And then there's the other end, which is my child has a lot of complex needs and these behaviors are happening in a lot of environments and we need to engage a lot of uh, people. It's gonna be what we call wraparound kind of functional behavior assessment. So, 
But families are important in all of these uh, phases. So we're going to talk a lot about the function based FBA, that middle tier of support, which is the most common kind of support you would likely see in, in your schools, and about your role in that process. So we'll go into this in quite a bit of detail. So we're going to talk about understanding why the behavior is happening. So function-based support, remember, that's the key, is understanding why the behavior is happening, because if I can understand why it's happening, then my intervention is going to be so much more powerful. I can, if I understand why it's happening, I can do things to prevent the problem from ever having to happen. I can teach a more appropriate alternative behavior for the situation. I know when to reinforce those newly taught behaviors and how to minimize the reinforcement that they're getting for that behavior that I don't want to see. So let's just move right then on into functional behavior assessment. And just so I can know my audience, how familiar are you with the FBA BIP process? Okay, we've got um, quite a range of people here. So uh, a lot of people here, most of the people who responded here um, know quite a bit, but they hope to learn more. Um, and then there are a few who, didn't, who have no idea or have only heard about them, but aren't sure. So we're got, gonna have a range here and I'll do my best to kind of go over things. But if there, if you have additional questions, please post the questions and we'll do, I'll do my best to, um, to kind of shore up some, if you need more information than what I'm providing. But I am going to give you a lot of <clears throat> more resources at the end so that when you want to get deeper, you'll have places you can go to do that. So, all right, so we're going to start with alert terms. And this is something that I, many, many years, 25 years ago or so, when I first came, uh, had gone into the family involvement world and then came back into the behavior support world, I felt like it was really important. We use this, these, we have all these processes that we use and we usually have special people who are trained to take you through a functional behavior assessment. And sometimes they're a board certified behavior analyst or they're, they're people who are highly trained and highly skilled and they use all these words from their training and, and background that as a family member or even just as an educator who's not got that kind of behavioral background, I may not understand and be familiar with. So here's just an immediate list of things and there, there are probably a lot more, but this is a nice little starter list. So these are some of the words that you might hear as you go through a process. And we'll talk about um, some of these, most of these today. Um, so hopefully if you see them, you can begin to understand those at a, at a whole nother level. So, but as a parent, if you see a word in a process that your child is going through with the school and you don't understand that word, I would really hope that you would feel comfortable taking the time to say, you know, I don't know what you mean by generalization. And I know what generalize means, but I don't know in this context, like in this situation, what do you mean when you say that term? And those are questions that you absolutely have the right to ask. So what is an FBA? So this is just a process that determines why the student engages in the behavior, right? And how that behavior relates to the environment in which it's happening. So this is, this is the key to having a functional behavior assessment. And the purpose of doing it is so that when you understand the behavior, then you can develop an effective and appropriate behavior intervention plan. So I can't do a behavior intervention plan unless I understand the behavior. So the functional behavior assessment is just the understanding the behavior step of the process. 
So then once I have that, I can use that information to develop the behavior intervention plan. So that's why you often see them combined because if I understand a behavior, but I do nothing about it, what good is that? If I do an intervention plan without understanding the behavior, it's just random, likely, will it work, not work? So when do we do an actual FBA? So this is a question that sometimes parents will have. Um, so some of the times that you may see them happening is when they're having a problem behavior that's impacting their ability to access their education. So um, again, if they're having a problem behavior and they're in a classroom that's chaotic, we don't know for sure that it's the behavior that's impacting their ability to access or whether it's the classroom itself. <clears throat> but more specifically, um, when the behaviors are persistent, so persistent meaning it just doesn't mean that the behaviors happened a, a couple times. It means that they have happened repeatedly and repeatedly impede the learning or prevent your child from learning despite consistently implemented school-wide and classroom-wide interventions. So that's what I just talked about. So <clears throat> if they're doing good class-wide interventions and school-wide interventions, but the individual still having persistent problems, behaviors that are impeding their learning, that's when we want to think about a functional behavior assessment. And there are some other situations. Uh, if the student is at risk of harm to themselves or others or injury, um, if the school is considering a more restrictive placement, must do an FBA. If the student has been subject to disciplinary action, um, and the behavior was determined to be related to their disability, then an FBA. And by federal law, um, you have to do an FBA whenever a child with a disability has an educational placement change for disciplinary reasons in the following instances. When a child is removed from school for more than 10 days consecutively for a behavior that's a manifestation of the student's disability. So, there are some times when we could see an FBA and sometimes when an FBA is uh, by law required. Any questions about that before I move on? Look in the chat. I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna go ahead, but Again, if you have questions, please um, pop them in the chat there. All right, so who actually completes the FBA? So usually it's a multidisciplinary team of people, which just means a, a team of people who come from different kinds of backgrounds with different kinds of background knowledge and expertise. But it should also include people who know the student have knowledge of the student and their behavior and have a vested interest in positive outcomes, which is family members, right? So families know their child, they know their children's behavior, and they have a vested interest in positive outcomes. So families absolutely have a right to be part of that team of people. Um, the people who know the context in which support will be provided. So the classroom teacher, if the classroom teacher is where the child spends their day and the classroom teachers needs to help them understand the behavior because they're the ones who are with the child. So it's really important to make sure. Now, there are cases where they will have a, a for instance, a behavior analyst come in and do the FBA in some class, in some school settings which means that they it's a person who's highly trained uh, in the behavioral science to come in and do this process that we'll be talking about. But it's important to understand that, that while they may be the one that's the point person who's completing the process, it's part of a team. And so they would need to include the teachers, the other people who maybe are part of that child's life in school or even out of school. 
And uh, so it's it's important that um, FBAs are conducted with uh, the people who not just who have the expertise, but also who are there in the context in which the behavior is happening and, so, and will be supporting the child. So what happens during an FBA and a BIP? So we got the two pieces, right? The determine the function or the purpose of the behavior and then de designing the plan. So in the function step, there's, or the function part, there's a couple steps. First, we identify and define the behavior, um, the problem behavior, and maybe identify a replacement for that. We collect data, which is just a way of gathering information about the behavior and the context. And then we create a hypothesis statement, which is just our way of saying, this we've identified the function of the behavior. So in these situations, this behavior occurs because, and we give the why. So that's that's what the in a nutshell happens in an FBA. And then the BIP process, we're going to design an intervention that's based on that function of the understanding that hypothesis statement. We know the situations where it's going to occur. We know what the behavior looks like and we know what happens after the behavior. So now we can design the intervention, provide the training and support to carry out the intervention because an intervention on paper doesn't do a child any good. Um, and then we implement the intervention and then we monitor how it's going. Are we doing what we said we're doing? Is it making a difference? So we're going to go through those steps. That was just kind of your big picture overview. And now we're going to go through the steps. So step one, the importance uh, of a family member being in this first step is because the, remember back when we talked about traditional ways of dealing with behavior and the, the, the new view, in the old view, we just eliminated a problem behavior. And in the new view, we're taking a broader look at what are the behaviors we want to see? How do we support um, individuals in doing that? Well, that's, that's like thinking about broad goals. So broad goals to make sure that uh, we could maybe stop some behavior. We could stop the talking out. We could stop the hitting. We could stop. But that in itself doesn't necessarily ensure a better quality of life, better outcomes on, on a broad sense for that individual. So family members being involved will help the school officials and people involved to remember those broad goals. What is it that you want for your child? So you don't just want them to, you know, sit quietly in their seat that's not a that's not a goal you're trying to achieve you want them to graduate from high school to have a lot of friends to be able to you know have have things that they're interested in and be able to be engaged in them and these are the kinds of goals that we want to have for our students and to make sure it's a student-centered process because <clears throat> Unfortunately, as we talked about that early example of in a classroom, teachers are just trying to get their instruction across and that's their goal. That's why they're there. And then anytime that something diverts them from that goal, that gets their attention. So the problem behavior, oh, now I'm going to pay attention to this. So in that same way, um, a function behavior assessment process can become staff and school centered which is what's going to be best for the school and the staff. And it's not, um, it's not like they're just out to, to do this evil thing. It's just the nature of everybody trying to get a lot done and do their own thing. So you want to be the voice and the family being there to remind them of the broader student focus and the goals. And so that's a really important part for you in this step. So remember, the first step is to identify and define a behavior. So one of the new terms that people in the field are using is they call behaviors contextually inappropriate behavior. So um, if you hear that, it, what it means is that all behavior is just kind of neutral. Behavior is behavior, right? It's anything we say or do. Um, and it's appropriate or not appropriate based on the context. Right. So 
like if you look at these pictures, this little girl running, we call that elopement. That's like our our fancy word for running out of their area. Um, well, is running out of an area um, always inappropriate? No, if you're outside and you're playing a game, it could be very appropriate, but in the classroom, not so appropriate. Um, <clears throat> being a tattletale, there are times when telling about somebody else is what somebody else is doing is not okay, and sometimes when it is okay. Chewing, chewing is not a, a bad behavior. It's just that chewing on certain things or in certain contexts could be problematic. Um, so you see the idea here is that we want to understand and think about behavior a very objectively and understanding that the context in which a behavior happens is really important. So when we think about behavior, um, again, we're gonna be thinking about what the purpose of behavior is or the function of a behavior. And all behavior, serves functions that can be broken down to these three categories. You have attention-seeking behaviors, behaviors that are about related to tangibles or activities, um, or sensory um, functions. And they're either positive in nature or negative. So this, ex this little <clears throat> frame it helps you to understand there are certain behaviors that you that people will do to get attention, and certain behaviors that you do to avoid attention. So like if I'm in a group, a staff meeting, and my boss says, I need a volunteer to take on this extra assignment. Everybody starts engaging in avoiding attention behaviors. I turn my eyes away. I get on my phone. I, you know, that's avoiding attention behavior, right? And then there's a tangible or activity things. So these are things that, that you, um, like, can hold or or do and sometimes you want those and sometimes you're trying to avoid those right so and then same with sensory so some people really like a sensory like i like the stimulation of getting up and moving around or i really don't like loud noises and so i will avoid um or engage in certain behaviors if the noises are too loud for me so all behavior kind of can come down to identifying being attention, tangible, sensory, and either trying to get or avoid one of those three things. Okay, so um, PDA is anxiety, which causes behavior, so anxiety. Yeah, so, um, right, so somebody who wants to avoid attention, right, so if, if, um, if I engage in certain behaviors because I'm trying to avoid um, attention, then it may result in anxiety because I am, you know, that's a behavior. Anxiety can manifest itself in certain behaviors. So certain things I say or do when I'm in an anxious state. Um, so that's... Um, so we want to <clears throat> first make sure, <clears throat> sorry, that we're clearly defining the behavior. So we can't um, understand a behavior that we aren't very clear about what the thing is that we're talking about. So you can see here uh, a poorly defined behavior would be like Sam is or hyperactive. That's a real common. He's hyperactive. He's too active. Um, so, but if I, I don't know what that looks like, like in my head, what a high level of activity is maybe one thing. And then when you look at it, your standard for what a high level of activity is might be something else. So we want to be as clear as we can in defining. So in this situation, when Sam leaves his seat, when Ms. Jones is delivering her instruction to the class. Um, so this and then I if I've said it this way, like if Sam is too active, what's my replacement? Don't be active. But if I say Sam leaves his seat when she's delivering uh, instructions to the class, 
then I know what I, the replacement is he needs to stay in his seat when she's delivering instruction to the class. So again, being very clear about what behavior it is that we're talking about, plus it gets everybody on the same page. So let's do that. Which of these are some well-defined behaviors? So we got a couple options here. Some of them are pretty vague and some of them are well-defined. So if you see any well-defined ones, Okay, I see people are people are voting on the on the two that I would consider to be well defined. We can go ahead and share that poll. So yeah, so you can see if it says Julia is aggressive, well, what does aggressive look like? Like if if you told me I need to go and watch Julia and she'll be tell me how many times she's aggressive, well, I don't know if she if she just bangs her fist down on her desk is that aggressive i don't is that what you consider aggressive or does that is aggressive mean that she's you know like physically um trying to act out to hurt somebody else or so these are things that are important so that when we're trying to understand a behavior we're all talking about the same behavior precisely okay so um <clears throat> Here's some more examples of, so if we have a behavior and it's, this is a common one in the classroom, leaving the seat. So if the definition is, he's referring to getting out of his assigned seat while the teacher is delivering instruction. And the examples are, he gets up, he roams, he goes to the pencil sharpener, he goes back in his backpack on the rear wall in the classroom. And then the non-examples are, he stays in his seat, his eyes are on the teacher or his materials that are related to the activity, and he raises his hand to request going to his backpack or to sharpening his pencil. So you see, we've now both defined it a little more clearly and provided examples and non-examples. So now, if I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna say, how many times did Sam leave his seat today? I'm going to have a lot more likelihood that if you ask how many times he left the seat and I ask how many times, we both come up with the same number because we'd be talking about the same behavior. <clears throat> so if we define the behavior, then we want to collect information about the behavior. And there are a lot of different ways that we collect information. There's indirect measures. Those are like interviews or maybe rating scales. Direct measures, which means I'm looking at the student and the situation and documenting something about it. <clears throat> and then there's, um, then we're gonna, again, try to come up with our understanding about uh, the behavior in a draft hypothesis then we can come up with a replacement behavior. Okay. So one of the not indirect methods that is almost always used are functional behavior interviews. So this is background information about the individual, about the behavior, the target behavior, um, possible antecedents, which is one of those trigger or target words. Um, antecedent it means the thing that happens before the behavior whatever's going on in the environment before the behavior and consequences are the things that happen right after the behavior. So doesn't necessarily mean often consequence has a negative connotation, but in this situation, we just mean whatever. Sometimes it's a positive consequence, but whatever happens after. And then it could be like understanding times of day or places. When does it likely to occur? When is it less likely to occur? And maybe what intervention strategies have already tried, what works with this individual, what doesn't work with this individual. So there are some, there are a lot of different forms that this may take. Um, this is an example of a functional assessment interview form, the young child version, but you'll see they'll be how describe the behavior, how often, how, how often it happens. Um, and then you go on to talk about different things in the environment that may be associated with it? Does it happen in every class period of certain classes? Does it happen um, with certain people or with everybody? Those kinds of questions. Then there might be student interviews. And these are really important um, 
because who knows better about why they're doing something than the individual who's doing the behavior. So in some situations, students are verbal and you can just talk to them and interview them and ask them these questions. In some cases, you might need to use picture cues to help to communicate with students. So um, they can take a lot of different formats for how you obtain information from students, but the kinds of things that you wanna ask would be similar. And then there's also the opportunity to find out what the student finds reinforcing. So in this case, it's like a reinforcement grid. What kinds of things do you like? Um, and in some cases, maybe you do visuals for students who can't read, it might be visuals. And so they can circle, or in some cases, it might be the actual things and objects like, going to the computer, playing with these Legos, you know, and you just lay them all out and have them point to the things they enjoy. And then family interviews. So um, sometimes um, it's good it would, in a perfect world, we would understand things about your child in every class before we wouldn't wait till there's a problem. So we would learn about your child's likes and dislikes and strengths and challenges and dreams and what works and doesn't work. And um, so that's this thing on the left lesson about my child, um, which some schools and some classrooms use. So if your school didn't do that and your child was having problems uh, in the classroom, I might just share this kind of information with my school. Um, I think maybe you need to understand my child a little better. And then there's the actual problem solving this challenging behavior. So um, do you experience this behavior at home? Have you found any effective strategies and that sort of thing? So these are some tools that we've used with our Behavior Alliance to try to help schools get information and work with families to get their perspective on the situation. So those are some indirect methods. And then there's also actual observation and direct observation and recording of information when they're being watched. So these are a couple of ways that that might look. It may be a rating scale, which might be, um, if I see the behavior, is it, how intense is it on a scale of one to five, right? So I might be rating the intensity of the behavior or maybe frequency. So how many times does the behavior happen over this period of time? I just tally mark each time it happens. Or the duration. So how long is this behavior la lasting? From the time it starts, I still keep my clock going until it stops. And we go, well, that was three minutes um, for that tantrum. Um, or latency. And latency is another one of those trigger where, you know, be alert about that term. It just means from the time that I give an instruction till the time that you actually engage in the behavior. So how long does it take from the time I ask you to get out your pencil until you get your pencil out? Or how long does it take from the time that I ask you to transition to the line up at the door until you actually line up at the door? So these are some different ways that we collect data about the behavior. Um, there's a, a lot more information on data collection um, and then a lot more forms. What I have for you is, a, is a, a grid that shows all these common ways that collect data with sample forms and sample video tutorials for how to use the different measures. So there's more information. Oh no, we can't have my battery go out right now. Um, so you'll you get a lot more information on data collection. But one of the primary pieces of information for helping to understand behavior is understanding what we call the ABCs. So antecedents, there's that word. It just means what happens before the behavior, which we've defined what the child's going to say or do. And then the consequences. Again, it just means what happens after. And we're trying to understand the function. So what are they getting or what are they avoiding in what happens after the behavior? So this understanding of the, we call the ABCs of the behavior is really critical piece of doing a function behavior assessment. So we really need to understand the behavior within the context, who's, who's there, when's it happening, what's going on and what happens immediately after the behavior. And by tracking that in routine fashion and looking for patterns, 
that's how we begin to understand. So here's a sample. Um, so the behavior, see, this is a child who gets up and out of their seat. So the behavior is kind of similar. And she walked out of the room without permission, hid in a cubby, went in the bathroom. So this is all like moving out of their assigned area. One was when they were told to clean up their materials. Um, one was at the end of a lesson and one was when she was told to pack up uh, and transition at the end of the day. So the what, what happened afterwards each time was the, the teacher talked to the student, the teacher packed them up, the pair cleaned up for them. So um, in all of these situations, they avoided the task. So they're supposed to do the end of the activity transition. And in every one of those situations, they avoided the they avoided the task. They did not end up having to do the transitional activity. So um, it's a lot of information about gathering um, in, information, uh, data collection, any thoughts or questions? You can put them in here or in the chat and I'll look at both. Okay, I think we have a couple of questions or people responding, but I can't see. Can you share the results of that poll? Oh, I don't, I don't seem to be able to see the, what people are. That's okay. I can read them out to you if that's helpful. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, just some sharing that this was great info. Um, a question about how can you make sure the person observing is fair? Mm. Well, um, in terms of being fair, uh, the idea is to be objective, right? That's the goal. And, and for most people who are doing direct observation. So if we collect, um, if we've defined the behavior really well, and I agree with the description of the behavior that, that you agree with. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is to um, have more than one person collect data. So there, in most cases, um, it would be nice to have multiple people gathering information about the student because if it all comes from one perception then we probably um, would have a skewed we might we might have a skewed perception of what's happening but if we get information if the teacher is collecting and, and reporting some information and then we have like a behavior specialist coming in and doing some direct observation because it's hard for a teacher to do that while they're teaching then you get what we call triangulating the data. So if what one person is reporting doesn't make sense with what another person is reporting, then it requires us to go back and maybe get even a third or another person to do observations. So um, I think that having multiple types of data help you to do that triangulation and to make sure that things match up and make sense. That's really helpful. Um, there was another question too about how long is the data collection done? Like what, how long is that process? Yeah, so the my our goal uh, from our perspective is you wanna collect enough information until you can understand the function of the behavior. <laughs> so there is nothing to be, there is no prize in like, we collected data for two months. Look how wonderful we are. That's not a goal. The goal isn't to collect tons of data. The goal is to collect enough data to have confidence in your understanding of the function so that I can now been, begin to predict when the behavior would happen based on certain conditions. And I can predict what would typically happen after the behavior based on my understanding of the certain conditions. So um it's 
in terms of a, the timeline that you would might expect, I would anticipate probably a couple of weeks of data collection on the average. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, there was there were two other questions I see, and then we have a few more in the chat. Um, do you need parent permission for completing an FBA? Yes, you have to have parent consent. And then does the school need to follow certain steps before contacting parents? Um, the school is supposed to have put in place school-wide and classroom-wide interventions. Um, so there should be those levels of supports that ha have been going on um, unless there's like a crisis situation in which the child, as I said, is in danger of hurting themselves or others. And then that you might, there might be a more rapid um, response of an FBA. That's, that's good to know. Um, there are a couple of families that um, from their experiences are just asking any ideas on how to encourage classroom staff to document those behavior observations. You know, they're getting a lot of emergency phone calls and behaviors are out of control, no time to follow up, no data, anything like that. Yeah, well, if if uh, if if you're being called and they don't have any data, I, that to me is a problem. I would I would want to um, I would ask for more documentation and specific contextual information about when the behavior is happening, how often it's happening, what kinds of interventions have been attempted. Um, those are the those are very standard questions and protocols that should be happening. So some really specific questions to ask that sounds like, and I know there was a lot of that great information in the resources that you shared. So we'll be getting that those out, a couple different handouts to family, to attendees following the training that may be helpful in, in having those conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And then I see one more, Karen, um, a son who, a, a person who has their son's been diagnosed um, with both types of ADHD as having some trouble now with school discipline issues and wanting to know if they can request an FBA. Um, you you could probably you can request whatever you want. The school probably won't unless there's there's minimal resources. Schools have minimal resources. So it's not that it's just that they have to be judicious about who they're using the resources to conduct these more intensive functional behavioral assessments with. So I would I would want to understand if, if they're having major discipline area issues, I'd want to know what are the behaviors are they happening? Like, I don't know, there's so many questions I have for that particular situation, but in every class, in every grade, with every teacher, the same behaviors, different behaviors. Um, so, so that you, you know, understanding from what you can find in terms of how often, when, where, what, and then, asking some questions about what's different from this year and last year in terms of the kind of supports and structures and environments that the individual is in also. Erin, thank you so much. This has um, been really helpful and um, just kind of hearing some of the questions and answers and I think the material and then like we said, some of the stuff that you'll be sharing um, is really gonna help. They'll misdetermine what questions to ask, who to involve, um, just to make sure that they're getting their answers. Yeah, so we're gonna run way out of time. So I probably will get through the FBA, but maybe not the BIP part, um, but we'll, for those of you who can hang on, I'll just keep going That's and then perfect. it be recorded. And, and if you have to leave, then you can maybe catch the recording to catch the end. I did drop. Um, uh, evaluation and the link. So folks do have to log off, that's fine. But like you said, we'll be sending the information out. So if you can hang on a few more minutes and want to stay with us to get through the rest of this, um, you are more than welcome to. So thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're now we're, we're trying to um, understand the setting events, the triggers, understand the, the what sets up the behavior to occur, understand the function of the behavior 
And sometimes parents are really good at understanding what we call the triggers or the setting events or the slow triggers. So like, oh, it always happens on the days where he didn't sleep or he didn't want to get out of bed in the morning or wouldn't eat his breakfast or, you know, you family members kind of can cue into certain kinds of contextual features of the scenarios in which behaviors occur that other, that schools just can't. Um, so again, we're collecting all this data because we want to be able to really hone in on when is it most likely to occur? Where is it most likely to occur and with whom? And understanding when it's least likely can be very helpful too. And what is, what is the adult and peer other people's response when that behavior happens? So inadvertently, adults and peers are reinforcing the behavior. Whatever's happening after that behavior is making that behavior happen again, right? Because it's paying off, we call it the payoff the behavior. The function is working. The reason that the behavior is happening is effective. So for that one student, she was getting out of having to do the transitional activities every time. Like she would misbehave, get out of the area and then she would result in her not having to engage in the transitional activities. So the idea is to understand when, understand the response and understand why. So are they getting or avoiding something and of those things, attention tangi tangible or sensory. So then you can create a summary statement. So in, the, in our case of Sam, if you remember when the teacher delivered instruction, the students were expected to sit quietly in their seat and listen, but Sam gets out of his seat and he does it to get attention from Ms. Jones and the other students, the function of his behavior is attention. So he, you, and that was the scenario in which he used the, the opportunities likely to happen when the teacher was delivering instruction that he would get out of his seat and he would, she would respond to him, talk to him, respond to him. The other kids would respond to him. He was getting all this attention. <clears throat> Um, but the mom realized that the similar kind of pattern happens at home. So when mom's talking on the phone, he cries and he pulls on her to get attention from her. So she sees a similar kind of thing. So then again, uh, understanding the behavior is one thing, but doing something about it. So if you have family focused goals, if you help, if family members can be part of like extending that new skill application into other settings and generalize, that's that generalization. We just learn a new skill or learn how to use a new skill, uh, use a skill appropriately. And then we wanna reinforce and encourage the use of that skill in lots of different settings. That's generalization and families are great for that. Um, so, and by going through this process, you're building your skills as a parent to understand function and impact and develop interventions on your own. So um, the, the strategies in a behavior intervention plan mirror those ABCs, remember? So I understand the antecedent. I understand what's occurring in the setting that when the behavior is going to happen. So now I can change what's happening in the setting before the behavior has to happen at all. And then the behavior, I want to replace it with an appropriate behavior. So maybe there's some skill training that needs to happen. We need to learn to use how to use a new skill. And then the consequence, we want to respond to the behavior in a way that reinforces a positive behavior and doesn't reinforce the behavior of concern. Right. So I'm not going to clean up her transition materials for her because that's what she's trying to avoid. Um, and then there are broader things like we can modify those setting events. If I know that when he wakes up tired, he's going to have a problem. It's often that day that he's going to have a problem. Then maybe I can communicate that to the teacher and she can let him, you know, put his head down on his desk for a little while, take a little nap on those days. Um so making sure that we're, our intervention plans are going to be successful based on what we know about the ABCs. So in this case, they move Sam's desk to the front, ask him to read the class rules for the, uh, about what we're supposed to do during teacher instruction. And Mrs. Jones is going to provide him verbal specific praise 
every five minutes. So she has a little timer that's going to go off, a little vibrator, then call her motivator, and it'll tell her every five minutes. And she's got, ah, Sam, you're still in your seat. I'm so excited. Just stay in your seat while I'm talking. And so the behavior strategies, we're going to remind him what's his expected. We're going to teach him. He can raise his hand if he wants to talk. So you can get attention in a more appropriate way. And we're going to teach the teacher because some of the behavior strategies and things we want the adults to do. And then if he sits quietly, then he gets to hand out and read the material. So he gets these attention activities. So he gets to uh, uh, be like a class leader and hand out and give instructions. And, and that's a, a really reinforcing thing because he likes the attention. And but if he gets up, she's going to ignore him and continue instruction. And she's going to teach the other kids to ignore him if he gets up, too, because everybody's going to get reinforced for staying in task and paying attention to the teacher. Um, so at home, mom can similarly come up with some strategies. So mom's going to have a picture story of what happens when she gets on a call. Phone rings. Mom talks. Mom's going to give Sam an activity. She has a preferred basket of activities that are only for phone when mom's on the phone. They're mom phone activities. And when mom gets on the phone, she, Sam gets to pick one of those. And then when he hangs up, mom's going to play with Sam. So uh, these strategies, that's some prevention strategies. And then um, afterwards, if he stays quiet while, and plays on his preferred toy while she's um, on the phone, then she'll give him a little undivided time afterwards. So um, these are some strategies that kind of mirror the, the ABCs you see. So we want to make sure that if there is a plan that we've got a lot of good strategies, because a plan on paper is only a plan on paper. It doesn't help anybody. So we need to know what has to happen in the case of um, the teacher. She needed to get the little motivator and set it to every five minutes and, and have a reminder for her that before her teacher-led instruction that she would have Sam get up, review the rules for teacher-led instruction. And so she needed a checklist of what she needed to do. And then how are we gonna know if it's working? How are we gonna know that we did it? How are we gonna know that it worked? So. We're going to know it worked because we're going to make a SMART goal. So here's an example of how you come up with a SMART goal. This was one where a teacher, um, the student was calling out all the time when he was not supposed to be. And so these are the occurrences in a week. So on Monday, 10, Tuesday, 15, Wednesday, 13, Thursday, 7. So if, if in a whole week, the lowest day, there was seven call outs having seven was almost half of what most other days look like. So if we just did that, that would be a goal, right? We just do the best day ever that we had in a week. And we did that every day. That would be make for a much better week. And then we can work on cutting that even down further in the future. Cause we want to make a goal, something that is achievable. And then we evaluate the plan. So we want to make sure that you're getting to weigh in as a family member, that you're communicating what's happening at home, um, that you understand the data that they're looking at, um, that you can help to recognize the behavior trends in looking at the charts and data, which I'll show you an example of, um, that they're actually looking at the fidelity of the strategies. Fidelity is just a word that means, are we doing what we said we do? So having an intervention plan, and then looking at how well the student's doing and only looking at student data. Oh, he's still up out of his seat every day. Well, did you, inter did you do the plan? How do we know you're doing the plan? What are the components of the plan? How many of those components are you doing every day? Because you can't expect a difference in the behavior if you're not actually implementing the plan. So without knowing that we inter in in implement the plan, we shouldn't be looking at the outcomes. We need to be sure that we've implemented the plan and then making adjustments. So this is what the data might look like in a good situation. So this here's, we're trying to teach this student here um, to use a request for getting up out of their seat. So this is a behavior they're teaching. And so it should, we want it to increase. And the green line is the fidelity. That's the number, the percentage of the points of the components of the plan that they implemented. 
And so it, they started out here about uh, 85, 90% of the components of the plan were implemented the first day, and then they went down, and then they went down. And so uh, he was doing better because we we're trying to increase this behavior here. And then as the fidelity of implementation went down, the you stopped seeing the behavior that we were trying to shape and increase. So um, this is what you want to be asking. If they, all they do is show you student behavior without any data about fidelity or what the which components of the plan are being developed, that's a red flag. And I would ask that question. So it's a lot of information. It's a lot more than you probably even anticipated today, but we've got more information for you. Got some really great links to some other modules to help you understand um, a functional behavior assessment process. Um, some of them are just documents. Some of them are um, actual modules you can go through. Um, and this bottom one is practice routines. They're actually video steps of this process that I kind of just talked to you about. And then if your children are in the young range and early childhood level, um, the website called challengingbehavior.org is just a wonderful place to go. Um, and some of the selected resources from that uh, site are linked here for you as well. Um, but there are a lot of great tools for you um, to use or that schools could use um, in supporting their, your children. And you already have the link. And this is my email. And again, at Basque Behavior on the social medias, or if you want to join our ma uh, mailing list, there's a QR code for you there. So I hope that um, this has been helpful for you. I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully you'll be able to follow up with, with some of the resources that we've provided and um, hope that it's helpful for you. If there are any last minute questions, I'm here to answer those. Karen, thank you so much. This was really, really helpful. Um, I know looking at the resource list um, is, the, the links are fantastic. And um, yes, to uh, the, the question of if we'll share the slides, we will. I'll send it out following um, the webinar and the rest of the materials. So if you have any questions, you know how to reach Karen. Um, and thank you all so much for being on today. Take care.